All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Beth Mine, and I'm the director of Georgia Tech's new Institute for People and Technology. We can keep saying new until the fall, and we'll quick we'll drop that. But um, thrilled to have uh, such a large and diverse audience. This is going to be a great event. We have a pretty tight schedule, um, and the food and drinks are after all of the panels, not during. So for those of you, okay, that was my attempt at a joke. Work with me. So. <laughs> On your table, you should see cool things like an agenda, like a cheat sheet about how you're going to interact with iPad uh, from today and going forward on some of these topics. Uh, you should see information about a set of industry roundtables that we are designing and looking to participate with you. And then you should also see an opportunity for money. Uh, some of you care about this. So this is the GVC grant program, which iPad supports. So, but right now, what you're going to do is turn your attention to this panel. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to Jeff Evans, the Deputy Director for IPAT, also Deputy Director over in GTRI, and he's going to introduce our first panel. Yes. Okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yes, yeah, so I'm Jeff Evans. Welcome. So I'm the Deputy Director for IPAT, and we're going to kick off the first panel here. And as you can see, the focus is on uh, big social computing, and, and what we're focusing on is the concept of What's the intersection with big data? Um, you know, it's incredibly significant because we see so many things out there with the, the growth of smartphones. You know, right now they only comprise about 15% of, of the phone usage that's currently out there, although the data usage is much, much higher than that. Uh, we expect it to be, uh, to grow tremendously so that by the year 2016, there'll be a billion smartphones out there. And that's not even counting the fact that there could be some estimate as many as 50 billion different sensors, machine to machine, all carrying data. So what is the intersection of this big data, the analysis, the communications aspects, and then how people might utilize it? So to address those three, we have uh, those, that particular topic, we have uh, three uh, esteemed researchers and panelists here at Georgia Tech. And uh, we have first uh, is going to be Dr. Eric Gilbert, who's an assistant professor in the School of Interactive Computing, and he's working on social media. Uh, uh, we, we drafted him. He's a very new member here, started in 2011 uh, here at uh, the faculty after completing a PhD at the University of Illinois. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Laura Weiss, who is the uh, a lab chief scientist over at the Georgia Tech Research Institute, and she conduct, conducts research on computational media, uh, computational methods for social media and robotics. And then we have uh, Dr. Jacob uh, Eisenstein, who is an assistant professor at the School of Interactive Computing. And he works on statistical natural language processing, which focuses particularly on social media analysis, uh, discourse, and nonverbal communications. So I think it's going to be extremely uh, interesting and fascinating showing how these uh, data intersects with social media. So to kick it off, I'd like to get Dr. Gilbert. Great. Thanks. Yeah, so we got one slide and I picked this picture. Uh, um, so, uh, so again, I'm Eric Gilbert. Um, I do work both in the design of social media and the analysis of social media, so I'm happy to talk about either. I thought with my opening remarks I'd talk a little bit about where big data uh, meets design. So uh, I think you know, both Laura and Jacob are going to talk more in detail about specifically just analysis, but I wanted to also talk about the design of these things. Um, so one, one thing that I wanted to say to kick this off is that um, social media is so big and so popular and so successful that it's sometimes easy to forget that the reason we do it is that we like to hang out with people, right? So, you know, that's one of the reasons I love this image, plus that it's, you know, public domain and I can use it. Um, but second, you know, one of the reasons I, I really like this image is that it conveys, I mean, you can't help staring at it and reading what's going on, right? There's a lot there. You're parsing the faces, you're parsing who's looking at who, who's laughing, whose mouth is open widest, right? <laughs> right? Who's not watching the speaker, who's trying to get the floor, right? Um, and until you oftentimes peel back the covers, social life seems really simple. And then you realize that it's actually really nuanced and really complex. And I, I make the argument that I don't think we're there. We're even close to approximating the ease of this kind of dinner party over the internet. 
right? And so, you know, my example of this is like, I think there's a bunch of really interesting cues that are piped into design that are based on very much something like this, right? So like when somebody tells a good joke at a dinner party, right, there's not a trickle of laughter sequentially, right? That doesn't happen, right? That's a bad joke. That's a bad joke, right? <laughs> um, there's a burst of laughter, right? And so, you know, a good example of this is that one of the, you know, the stories that you see in your Facebook newsfeed are disproportionately those that attract likes in short amounts of time, right? So it's not just 50 likes, it's 50 likes in, you know, 30 seconds are better than 50 likes over 10 minutes, right? So that's really piping this kind of dynamic into that. Um, yeah. Um, another good example of the complexities, you know, and the things that people do that are interesting and counterintuitive in these kinds of large-scale systems. Um, I teach an online communities class that I've inherited from Amy Bruckman, and I hung out with a bunch of 21-year-olds and talked about the internet. It's fantastic. Um, so, you know, recently, Facebook introduced the feature on your news feed where when it's someone's birthday, it says, wish them a happy birthday. Right? By the way, it's my birthday today, so I'm, I'm yeah, I know, right? <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, the idea presumably was that, oh, wouldn't it be great if everybody knew when everybody's birthday was? And a bunch of undergrads told me that they are exploiting this in a number of very interesting ways. For example, one student told me that what she does is a few days before her birthday, she unfriends a bunch of people, and only those people who wish her happy birthday without the aid of Facebook get friended back. <laughs> right? <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm trying to convey is that, like, there's these weird discontinuities that are introduced by design elements and manifest themselves as later as data, right? Um, and I think that's really interesting. The, the broader point that I, want, I wanted to bring up and just kind of sketch out was that I don't think we have a very good handle on what works and why in these systems. It's just kind of a happy accident when a social media site takes off and gets a lot of users, right? And I think if you follow the valley, right, it's just a series of random experiments. <laughs> and, you know, it's great when the next one kicks off and they figure out how to gain users, right? But I think there's a really interesting opportunity here to try to figure out some general purpose design guidelines for building social media at scale with data. So I just wanted to raise that point as a possible place that we could look for new opportunities. But I'm also happy to talk about the pure analysis stuff, which I also do. All right, thank you. So um, we get to tweet instead of Facebook, we can tweet your birthday, is that? Yeah, tweet my birthday, I'll, okay. I'll be very impressed actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we'd like to hear from uh, Dr. Laura Weiss. So we got this email saying, please make one slide, and there were a whole list of questions that went behind the slide, and I took an attempt to answer the questions, as opposed to just putting up one graphic that, that much more genuinely captured it. Although I want to know why you think it's a dinner party and not a coffee clutch. Ooh, it might be. Ooh, it might be. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, so we have some pictures up here, and as as Jeff had, and we can't see them sitting with our backs yeah. to the slides. So one picture would have been better. But we, um, we, as we know, there's tons and tons of social media data. That the top um, left graphs just say what we all know about, you know, Twitter and Facebook. You know, Facebook hitting a billion this month. Um, but the question of, of the grand challenges, so it, when it comes from a computational and research perspective, what are some of the grand challenges that we foresee happening? And number one is analyzing billions of pieces of data in real time. Can we do it in real time streaming? And um, let, me, let me throw out a statistic here that um, I was reading that, that the real time may is, is profitable. The, um, the, in 2010, Smartphones, the smartphones themselves, are not necessarily sitting at the computer, but the smartphone data usage was at 200 petabytes per month. That's how of data was going through smartphones. And it's estimated that by 2015, that will be 58,000 petabytes of data per month. And I calculated that is 400 quadrillion text messages a month. So now you know why it costs more to text than it does to talk on the phone. If you're sending 400 quadrillion text messages a month, you're going to be a company that's going to go after 
those text messages and try to charge as much as you can for those texts. So analyzing that data rapidly, getting hold of that data, and look, coming up with new computational methods, I do believe is a grand challenge. Um, Demonst and the second bullet goes along with that, you know, demonstrating game changes, um, game changing computational methods for that. Um, but this automated analysis plus automated effectors, so you can start doing targeted reach. Everyone's doing their social media work on their smartphones now. Um, how do we start reaching people and targeting what they want to do and doing that in an automated way? I think that's another direction of where we're going. Um, instead of just being the recipient of data, um, now, if I'm a company, I want to be able to start going after people in a more targeted way and, again, making money. It's about making money from those companies who want to target you. So can we start developing computational approaches and analytic methods that will help focus um, who, who and what and how and why we're targeting it? But that last bullet is of equal importance. We have to do that appropriately. How do you shape policy um, if you're going to if you're gonna be um, aggressively putting out texts or, or other social media content. So you have to be shaping policy and regulations. We don't want to be doing anything inappropriate, but there's a whole domain of computational, computational research that goes along with that policy once it's shaped. So um, the landscape is there are lots of, there's lots and lots of research going on in analyzing the data. Um, there's less research on that targeted reach. Um, and there's where your potential for commercial applications and commercial partnerships. Um, you can imagine a lot of advertisers would love to know how to do that effectively, quickly, cheaply, and um, reaching as large number of users as, as many of those um, people who are sending all those 400 quadrillion texts of data a month. Um, and this is multidisciplinary. So the multidisciplinary piece is really interesting um, because it requires not only the computational aspect but understanding behavioral research and, and marketing, you know, market methodologies. And what I have here on the right, um, it's, it's hard to tell to see these words here, but these are the human universals. If you talk to anyone in the behavioral psychology, they're pretty fluent in these. But human universals are features that are found among all peoples across all cultures and, um, and history and all time. So they're, they're behaviors that are prevalent and constant throughout our societies and peoples of the world. And we can now, if we understand some of this behavior and fold it in with our computational methods, start exploiting even, even more advances in what we can do with these smartphones and handheld devices. And I, I put a, cul a couple of examples up there. Um, on the top right, so if you can't read it, it says culture, language, social, behavioral, and mind. So culture, one of the, these um, human universals is culture, and, and, and a characteristic of that is mythology. And so even though we may hear, know about um, mythology that's local to you and however you grew up, um, very few of us probably, under, just looking around the room, may understand um, a myth or the nuances of a myth from Sudan or from Chile or Argentina, unless you grew up in those cultures and countries um, yourselves. So this may now, um, become a new biometric, a form of a biometric, to be able to do validity of, of, some, of, of, of a person if you pose to them an aspect of a myth and they respond in a, um, in a way that does not cor correlate with what the real myth is about. If you, if, you're, if you grew up in that culture, you would know what that myth is about. But um, if somebody started talking to you about, we are, we're a Disney, you know, in, here in America, if someone started talking about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and they started talking about, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk in that, in that context, well, the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs doesn't have Jack and the Beanstalk in it. Maybe this person doesn't fully understand, is not fully um, understanding of, our, of that myth, myth. Maybe they really aren't a native of that society. I'm, I'm exaggerating things here. But there may be some element of of verification, of identity verification of a person if you start bringing in some of these human universals. So those are some of the challenges of doing the multidisciplinary research and seeing what, how much farther you can go with some of these computational methods. So um, I guess, how are we supposed to wrap up? Is that good? Uh, yes, we're going to have okay. questions in just a few moments because I'm sure there's going to be a number. Okay. But uh, So thanks, Laura. So uh, Jacob. Yeah. Um, so I was just thinking about what I would want to talk about in this in this panel, and you know, I think going along with what Laura was saying about about targeted reach, one of the attractive things for people that are trying to reach people in a targeted way with uh, with social media is the idea of um, metadata that accompanies social media. So you can now find out all these different things about where someone went to college or um, when they were born or so on. So I was thinking about you know what sort of constitutes, so what, what could you say about me as a person? Well, 
you know, I live in Atlanta, but I haven't always lived in Atlanta. Um, I'll say mid 30s, I'm like 5'8 on a really good day. So, you know, there's sort of, you know, different kind of statistics that you could say about somebody, but really, like, when it comes to actually predicting what's going to make a difference to me, um, what I'm going to do in a situation, what I'm going to respond to um, as information or as an appeal, um, you need to go deeper than just a list of statistics that you can say about a person and actually come up with some notion of, of really what they consider as their personal identity. Um, and one, I think, one real window into the sense of people's sense of identity beyond just the statistics that you can write down about them um, is, is identity is almost, almost always revealed through language. Um, and so this is something that I've actually been focusing on over the last couple of years, trying to reconstruct um, different identity groups of people um, based on the kind of language that they use. So the, um, the graph or the, the, the picture that I have up there is from some analysis that we did of Twitter. Um, we, this was based on a data set of, of 10,000 people on Twitter just posting messages for, for one week. So we've scaled that up by about two orders of magnitude since then. But this is a smaller data set. Um, and what we did was we looked at the language that people used and we looked at their, um, their GPS locations because that's metadata that we had from Twitter. Um, and we came up with regions of the United States where people use language in coherent ways. So each uh, color and symbol represents a different region where people use language in a, uh, in a similar way. And some of the things that we saw with the language that people used were expected to us. So people will actually talk about Waffle House more in Atlanta, for example. Um, some were more kind of slang type terms that we were interested to see if they would turn up in social media. Uh, we knew about these things from the research literature on speech, but we didn't know if they would show up in social media. Um, and a number of things, a surprising number of things, are actually really social media specific. So getting back to what Eric was saying about um, the design of the sort of social affordances that we have in social media, um, at least in terms of language, has a real impact. Um, and people seem to have this need to express um, aspects of their personal identity when they communicate. That just seems to be a really basic thing. Um, social media sort of removes certain affordances for doing that, the tone of your speech. You know, you can't convey um, a certain type of accent, for example, um, directly in social media. Well, people will transcribe that accent. They'll write a phonetic version of a word um, with their regional accent transcribed into the way that they've written the word. Um, so that's just a way that the affordance sort of comes into play. Um, so this is, again, something I've been looking at over the last couple of years, reconstructing different notions of identity from social media data, especially linguistic data. Um, and I think the sort of second phase to that um, that I've started to work on just recently um, is once you have different groups or communities um, detecting patterns of influence um, and the spread of ideas across those kinds of communities. So you can, we have data now over the course of more than almost two years at this point. Um, and we can see how some new word, like some new Twitter, you know, like LOL. Well, there are new versions of LOL being born and dying every day. Um, but some of them um, will start, you, you can find them starting in some place and then spreading across the United States. And so what I'd like to get to is a quantitative model where we can sort of predict um, that kind of diffusion of influence, diffusion of ideas. So that's it for me. Uh, excellent. So I'll have a couple of questions as well, but first, uh, in the interest of time, wanted to open it up to the floor and see if you had some specific questions for the panel. Yes. We've been doing some research on um, early adoption of technologies to see if the same kind of behaviors will, um, so early adoption of technologies may be the same as early adoption of, of some of the information that comes across your devices as well. And hoping that you can look at some of the, just looking at the patterns of behavior, is it happening faster and, and what are the, the time constraints. What I want to say is when he, he put that, when Eric put the picture up of, of the social scene, what is happening here is social media, there's two words there, social and media. Social is a constant. We've always been social people. What's new is the media. And so there's a lot of the market-based techniques that have been going on in the past, but now it's happening faster. 
or the, the, the media is allowing things, the, the, the timeline has, has just been compressed. So there are many methods that have been applied in the past that we now need to start reducing at local scales and having them happen you know, at the level of a, a vending machine as opposed to a supermarket. So can we start, it's more of the targeted um, type of work that we have going on there. Um, yeah, I just want to follow up with that. Uh, you know, I think in many ways the computational marketing space is like is similar to finance and academic departments, right? In some ways ahead of the curve of, of industry and in some ways behind the curve of industry. So I think a lot of the stuff that's going on we don't actually know, right? So I mean, a lot of it's under wraps. Um, I can speak from personal experience having launched a number of Facebook ad campaigns that it is, if you've never done it, go try it. <laughs> go see the way that Facebook packages and sells you. It's actually totally fascinating, right? So like, for example, you can slice and dice the user population any which way you want, right? So if you want, you know, women 25 to 32 who have kids, you can get those even if they haven't said who their kids are, right? Because they talk about diapers, right? <laughs> right. So it would seem like with all of this and people trying to determine identities that it would be the next big, one of the next big things could be a large scale misinformation of social media. Is that something that you see people trying to, trying to use? Yeah, we see it all the time. Right? I mean, there's a, there's a, so again, from personal experience, I spread a, a, a false rumor about a month ago <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's unclear uh, oftentimes the intentionality behind these things, right? We know that there's lots of misinformation spread on Twitter. It's often hard to track down whether it was intentional or not. That's probably how I would kick that off. But it's really your birthday. Yeah, so there was a, just to amplify that, <laughs> <laughs> um, there, was, there was a farmer out in the Midwest who was tweeting about his crops, and there were commodities exchange folks on the East Coast in the New York area where, that were following his tweets. So, so you have to ask the. So, if he was overtly tweeting, and it worked, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if he was overtly tweeting misinformation, it, you know that gets um, tamped down pretty quickly. But if he was very subtly trying to um, tweet misinformation, you have to. So what a research area is what are the strategies that people use to, when they tweet misinformation to be subtle versus overt and it doesn't matter. And the other question is, is what are the detection mechanisms that go on in people's minds when they start looking to detect? How, how do you know something is false or something's not quite right? And what are the methods that we use to understand that and, and can, we, can we make those computational as well? Yeah, I think another, um, just to add one more thing with respect to misinformation, um, you can, uh, you know, obviously, if you just have a Twitter account by yourself and you're just sort of spreading lies, you probably a lot of people aren't going to follow you, and you're not going to have a lot of um, you're not going to have a lot of chance to make a big impact that way. So there's a lot of interest, I think, in constructing artificial social networks where it looks like you have a big influence and therefore you accumulate more followers. And doing some kind of social network analysis where you can distinguish between networks of of all artificial accounts that are created for sort of misinformation purposes versus authentic networks, um, I think, is one direction towards that goal. Great. Um, so far, they've at least been very open about, about letting people get, at least from my standpoint, you know, what's, what's a very large amount of data for me. Um, that's only one type of resource. So, you know, Twitter, um, I think because their model doesn't require the same kind of uh, deep tie to personal identity that Facebook does, um, they can afford to be a little bit more open in terms of letting people gather data. If I was to do the same thing on Facebook, you know, the, the privacy concerns are much more serious. Excellent. I'm sorry, I think we're going to have to wrap this up for the next panel, but I certainly appreciate it. I believe that you see there's a tremendous opportunity. Georgia Tech has 
um, a lot of capabilities here, and Beth, you but, but I still get the last question. You get, Beth gets the last question. All okay. Right. <laughs> I'm paying for the drinks. Um, the, so you three are really kind of painfully aware, I suspect, of what other agencies and other universities and folks are doing in this space. I mean, we have to ask either what is unique or the competitive advantage of what we're doing at Georgia Tech, or what could we create in terms of a competitive advantage in what is an extremely crowded field with a lot of hype surrounding it. You know, so you know, what would, where would you advise Georgia Tech focusing or kind of dis, um, distinguishing ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> just to the left. Oh. <laughs> that, that's that's a, it's a loaded question because you know I'd hate to say focus down on any one thing, but I really do believe going instead of just sucking in data and analyzing it, but also looking at ways to go back out and doing the tar what I was calling the targeted reach. I think there's an opportunity there. I don't, don't want to say nobody's doing it, but everybody. Uh, uh, I think there's a large, a lot more competition in analyzing it because you suck the data in, and so being able to reach back. Um, but there's all sorts of p policy issues, and and to do research on it, you need IRB approval. You you can't just say, okay, I want to do this, and I think I'm doing it right. So there's the whole IRB issue, and being able to do um, IRB research in, like you said, non non artificial environments, and doing it with billions of pieces of data is a challenge. If I may add one thing to that. Um, there are a million people doing sort of data mining kind of stuff on social media. Um, very few of those places have, uh, none of those places really have the kind of strength in understanding social computing and the way that computing relates to people's social lives that Georgia Tech has. So I would say that's, that's a real advantage that we have here. Excellent. So uh, please ask questions during um, our reception later. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more discussion throughout the summer and over the next year. So I uh, thank the panel. Thank you. All right, so very quickly we'll switch into the panel. Is John here? Okay. All right. I've been worrying about you all week. So as, as the panels change over, you know, clearly the kinds of things that we want to ask at IPAT are, you know, what are our research ambitions? What do we think uh, is our research leadership opportunities here, and then I'm just going to keep asking until other people start asking it for me. You know, where can really, where can Georgia Tech distinguish itself? Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to Ed Price for our panel on sports entertainment. Afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I think we have a um, interesting panel here. I'll dive right in. Um, first, we have John Stasco. Um, he's a professor and the and associate chair of the School of International Computing here. He also has been teaching our course on sports analytics and just has a lot of personal interest in the field. There's your slide. All right. So uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, I'm, I'm here because I'm just a huge sports fan and uh, <laughs> just did do all kind of sports things. As uh, the angle I think I'll talk a little bit about is, is connects well with the last panel, data. So data and data analysis, I wouldn't say they've been revolutionizing sport, but sport has been evolving to take advantage of it. Uh, baseball's probably the oldest sport uh, in kind of using it, and there's things about baseball, the individual event sequence, pitch, hit kind of thing, it works well, and Moneyball, of course, has kind of taken it all off. Um, so more and more sports and people in sports are becoming aware of, of how data can work to an advantage. And this, this area of sports analytics has emerged. I've been co-teaching uh, the class on it with Rahul, who's sitting over there the past couple of years. Um, not really, we don't do all that much. We invite in some speakers. We had people like Frank Wren, general manager of the Braves, this spring come in and give really interesting talks about uh, how sport is, is evolving d down the lines there. Uh, at Georgia Tech, I think we're particularly well positioned to take advantage of this for a couple of different reasons. On the kind of technological science side, we're obviously a leading place. We have a lot of students, a lot of our undergrads enjoy going to football games and doing other activities to go along with those games, and, and they're really smart and, and good technologically. 
On the other hand, we play big boy sports as opposed to MIT, CMU, Caltech, etc. cetera. Um, we have, you know, division, division one kind of top. And, and that actually, there's a difference. Um, MIT runs the Sloan School, the management school at MIT runs a course on sports analytics with ESPN and they've kind of nailed that one and kind of taken over the market. But obviously, they, they can do certain things up to a level, but it's, it's still MIT uh, and we'll crush them um, in football <laughs> or whatever. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah. So uh, my, my particular, just to finish up, my particular interest, I do a lot with data analysis and visualization. You see a couple of pictures, uh, an old one, a master's student, Andy Cox, worked with me and we tried to understand how different pictures you know, affected their team over the year. And I think that may be Kurt Schilling in the Red Sox one year. And over on the right side, um, two new PhD students, Hannah and Chad, that work with me, got all the data from every shot of the NHL season a year ago. And they constructed a variety of different visualizations that you can query and examine. And they've done an interesting study where they talked to, to some uh, hockey analysts and general managers and folks like that. Uh, really trying to understand it. It's a tough area because we're not going to get a lot of money for any of this, right? Pro teams can get these things done for free. There's 10,000 kids who will do it for nothing because they just want to get in. I can't write an NSF grant about why hitting a hybrid from the rough is better than a four iron on something. That's, Rahul gets that. Um, that's. Uh, <laughs> That's not going to work. So it, it's tricky. ESPN has just, you know, done an agreement with us, and there's get a little bit getting going that way. But it's, I think, work that we do in this area. Some of it we're just going to have to do because we love it, and it has a chance to be interesting and make an impact. Thanks, John. So the um, first um, goal of this panel, I guess, is to crush MIT. Um, I will say that from ESPN's perspective. We're one of their three university partners. We're, we're the only one that has big boy sports. And they see that as a, as a big distinguishing factor that why they should fund us as well as MIT and CMU because we can do things naturally the other two just cannot do. They don't have a stadium that fills up with 50,000 fans on Saturday afternoons, and we do. So um, thanks, John. Next up, we have um, Shane Owens. Um, of course, my iPad went to sleep. <laughs> Shane's a research engineer at GTRI and the Landmark Research Center. Um, and he is one of the um, PIs whose proposal has been funded by ESPN for the summer for our first round of projects funded by them um, on in-game fan engagement using mobile apps. Um, but Shane's interest is broader than that. Thanks. Um, I want to key off of something that, that John said, and, and that is that the sports industry is evolving with, with data. Um, and, and I want to focus in on a few areas that I think it's involving, um, and that is in fan engagement and training, and then also just in terms of new paradigms of how of what sports are and how we compete. I think the the lines are starting to blur between uh, virtual and real competition, and, and between games and and uh, and what a sport is. I think that. The Olympics 2112, who knows what kind of sports are going to be there, uh, but I think we might see some sports that we think now we think is more game than sport. Um, so I want to start with fan engagement and talk a little bit about the uh, ESPN uh, grant that, that we have. And we're looking um, at how we can engage fans in during the competition into the competition, not not just you know is the hammer going to win at the between innings sort of thing but but looking at uh you know words with friends meets football sort of thing uh we're looking at you know can you guess the next play and compete against each other but i think it's much broader than that there are going to be lots of, of of ways that uh, social media and, and these sort of mini games is going to have an impact on the game experience for a large number of people not everyone a lot of people will just want to enjoy the game. Um, I think if fan engagement can actually go a step further where there can be crowdsourcing involved that actually impacts uh, what happens in the game. Uh, the earliest version of this is during the times of the gladiators when they did the thumbs up, thumbs down, and made, made the decision of what the ultimate outcome was. Um, 
but I think you know, in, in today and in, in going forward, there's going to be some interesting things uh, related to that. I know some, some guys over in uh, the School of Music um, were thinking about ways they could use crowdsourcing to help um, impact what, what songs get played during the football game, which ultimately impacts the atmosphere of the game itself uh, to some degree. On the training side of things, a lot of things, uh, 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 some things are already happening uh, from a virtual standpoint. Um, you may have seen at the gym, you have treadmills or stationary bikes where you can actually compete against others. You could be on, a, on an actual real route. Um, and this uh, inverse cycling does that, except you can actually use your own bike and hook it up to a a station and it provides resi uh, resistance and everything to make you feel like you're going up uphill and they've taken it a step further where they actually have competitions where dozens of cyclists come hook up their bikes to these stations and compete and winner gets like five grand to do it um, and so I think you know you're getting you're starting to see the, the start of these sports that merge with the the virtual side um, and and I work with Leanne and um, the Lamar Research Center, she's the director, and uh, we're looking at, at ways that you can combine um, up here the, you know, running in your living room or on a treadmill with, um, uh, with a virtual, you know, in a virtual world. Our, our focus is on childhood obesity, but we've also thought about ways that you can then combine that with the real world. You know, if you're running on, in, a, in a virtual, uh, you know, on, in a virtual on a virtual route, say, in Paris, and you could, you could run against someone who's running actually, or run with someone who's running in Paris, maybe they, they've got a Google Glass on and they can see uh, your avatar and you, you're, they're using RunKeeper and so their GPS is being tracked so you can see their avatar. So I think there's going to be some interesting ways that, that things uh, uh, evolve in that respect and, and create new ways of, uh, of competing and redefine what how we see sports thanks shane um next up we have leanne west she's the director of the, Re the landmark research center and a principal research scientist at gcri um her interest really is on mobile and wireless technology application development thanks ed um so as shane said we work together so we have a lot of the same ideas um Fan engagement, yeah, you can tell he built his slide first and then I stole the format. <laughs> um, but fan engagement, I think, is, is going to change over time um, with all of the, the way media will allow them to. Um, you can get more information in real time than just what's happening in the game. Maybe statistics are streaming in front of you now with your Google glasses, as Shane talked about. Um, but there's all sorts of things that you could do to inspire the fans if you had another means to get information to them. Um, in addition to that, uh, one of the things that Ed, well, we talked about with ESPN, um, we put in a proposal saying that we wanted to engage children in between plays in the game because games can be kind of long and boring for kids who are younger. How do you engage them in the middle of the game and keep their interest there? And uh, so we talked about being able to maybe link up how the, what you're watching on TV links up to an app on your iPad and prompts you to, to play different games in the middle or interact in the middle. Um, kind of similar to what Shane was talking about with you know crowdsourcing or guessing the next play, but maybe doing it on a kid-friendly level. Um, other areas where I think sports are going to change and be kind of interesting is in education. I think that you can use a lot from sports in education to engage um, children in learning. And you can see kind of on the left-hand side in the bottom picture, that's actually a picture of a baseball game in the infrared. And I just had the pleasure, I know y'all are laughing at me, of watching a baseball game in the infrared last week. And it was really interesting because when the baseball player would hit the ball, there would be a hot mark left on the bat, and the ball on one side where it had had the impact with the bat would also be hot. So you could see the impact, physically see the impact of the ball on the bat. And I thought that that was really fascinating, and I thought what a great way to perhaps engage students who are learning about physics and momentum and impact and trajectories and all that kind of thing, if you could show them something from sports. Um, right next to that is a picture of an app that we developed, and it's just a take on the uh, beanbag toss game that you could play outside tailgating at a sports venue. And we took it and we used the accelerometers to determine your angle of 
uh, release and the velocity that you release the bean bag and show the physics behind that. And so we think that there are games that can be modified again for learning purposes and making it kind of more fun and more interactive and maybe you could play that um, in, a, in some area that you couldn't play the real game. And then lastly, I think that uh, sensor technology is really going to change the future of sports. I think that it's going to change it in a couple of ways. One, I think that you're going to be able to learn more about what's happening with the player health-wise. So there's some research going on putting impact sensors in the pads of the football <laughs> players and seeing what kind of impact the player is receiving and then how does that affect the person? Did they get a concussion? Was it, what kind of hit was it? But also you can imagine taking that same data and doing something really fun with it. So maybe there's some sort of interactive game that you develop or experience that you develop along with while you're watching TV where players hit and you can see the impact and it makes it that much more exciting, kind of like fights in hockey or something, I don't know. But just knowing how hard the players were hit um, could be something that could be interesting and, and increase fan engagement. So you can imagine how all sorts of different sensors could play into the game and change how people really view sports and interact with sports. Thank you, Leanne. Um, so we've got a couple of ESPN projects launching this summer. We're going to launch more projects in the fall. Some of you may not have gotten final yeses or noes yet because we're still negotiating that with ESPN. But starting in the fall, we'll have some more traditional things you might expect like machine learning, computer vision, some of those sorts of things will be launching as well. Um, but we tend this, this is a multi-year relationship with ESPN. We hope to grow and do great things with them. But they're not our only outlet for sports research here. We have others. Um, one thing I've... We'll go ahead take some questions for the audience first, and I've got a few questions. So do the audience have anything they want to ask? Other than Beth? Okay, well then I will start with one. Um, I know one of our competitive advantages is that we have real sports. What else do we have that's a competitive advantage in this area? One thing that Georgia Tech has in general is the sensor technologies that we develop and work on and have experience with. Um, if we wanted to go the route of using sensor technologies for educational purposes or health purposes or even the entertainment purposes, I think that we have a lot of that here that we could build on and that sets us apart. I think, I think there are so many components involved that you know, Georgia Tech has a lot of strengths and whether it's, you know, the social computing aspect, data analytics aspect, um, the wearable computing aspect, um, and, you know, so the augmented reality type of things and, and, and looking at games um, the way that they are, I think, you know, I could see a game, I don't, I don't know if this would necessarily be a sport where you could kind of, kind of combine the Argon browser with the new uh, Nerd Herder application. Mm -hmm. And you have like one person being, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but you could have one person being like the, uh, the game maker and uh, all the other folks are actual players on, you know, on the, the, the CRC field or something so like that. So you could turn this room into a game of Nerd Herder? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Renew. So my question, I guess, is related to that. Is what kind of um, portfolio do we have in the ATDC companies, for example, that focus on this? Is that something that we should be um, leveraging? So, so look at the range of companies at ATDC out there that are focusing on this. I want to toss that question to Stephen because I don't have a good answer for it. That actually raises an issue that ESPN's brought up with us, which is um, ESPN and the other sports broadcasters go in and buy the rights to a college's entire portfolio of sports. So they may have not only rights to Georgia Tech, ACC football, 
they get all ACC sports as part of a package deal. Well, that includes lacrosse, gymnastics, soccer, sports that aren't going to be probably broadcast on Fox Sports South or ESPN2 or other channels. How can, but then the colleges and universities are frustrated that they can't get those sports any coverage. So how do we lower the cost of, of providing those broadcasts and make them compelling enough so there's a large enough market to pay for it? Um, and I think that, you know, over time as we start fleshing out this research portfolio area, maybe we'll have some companies that we can spawn out of iPad out of some of these funded research efforts. Um, what else could iPad do to help in this area? Are there things we should be doing? Resources, data, partnerships, workshops? I think that having um, you know industry roundtables about this, where you know we can vet ideas with the industry experts, to, and I mean I think that fan engagement, for example, I mean the the proposal that we submitted was a I, I would say it's fairly simplistic, but it's something that they're really interested in. Um, so I think that it's. I think it's important for us to, to be able to, to get a better handle on what, it, what kinds of things they're looking for. I think we could, so, you know, Turner and CNN, et cetera, being here as well as the Braves, the Falcons, et cetera, provide interesting opportunities and in some type of, of workshops or coordinated effort. Um, as I mentioned, the MIT does the sports analytics conference, but it's largely management they're doing because it's Sloan and so I think there's still some room there on the more technological side of things that, that we could perhaps step in and get something going. Great. Um, we've done our 20 minutes. Beth may have a question for us. If not, move on to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Ed asked all my questions. Here's your uh, I'll just do this one. I'll stay wired. All right, yeah, you guys have to come over closer to me, somewhere in the middle. So as, as Amy and Irfan join me, you know, part of you may be wondering, well, where did these topics come from in the first place? And it's been part of a messy, organic, and interesting process since we did the town hall launch back at the end of March, where it's a combination of these were the things that the faculty were clamoring for in terms of these are the things that iPad and Georgia Tech should be engaging as well as these are the things that are new opportunities, for example, our new engagement with ESPN. Um, I think many of you know our next two panelists, Amy Bruckman and Irfan Iza, who represent a long tradition of research within social computing, computational perception, and computational journalism. And so they asked for, and I thought made perfect sense within this town hall, that we create a space that looked at some of our uh, emerging ideas around civic uh, computing and uh, both of them kept talking about the new public square. And I think it gets back to, to Laura's comment that social has been around for a long time, but the media part is new, and what are we going to do about that? So I'm going to get away from the microphones. But I think, Irfan, you're up next. And do you want to just, well, I've got the video, but you want me to go in the opposite direction? Amy has to leave, so we're going to Amy. <coughs> All right, Amy Thanks. Brickman. Thanks very much, Beth. I, I did computer. warn Beth that I have to leave it at 3.30 sharp, uh, and I did warn Beth that it was inevitable that this was going to run late. You're, I'm losing the lining of my stomach, but I am happy to be here and uh, want to tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, some work that Eric Gilbert and I are doing on uh, Public Square Atlanta. So our, uh, a, a couple years ago, I got the opportunity to meet the folks at Public Broadcasting Atlanta, our local NPR affiliate. And they're rethinking what is their role in this new media landscape. And one of the ideas that they came up with was uh, that part of their new role could be not just to tell people about the news, but tell people what they can do about the news. So they made a, a website called Public Square Atlanta, and it's up now. It's been up for a number of years. And they paid a, uh, they had a grant, and they used their grant money to uh, pay a vendor to develop the site. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say they would not use that vendor again. 
uh, I have tried to do stuff on the site, and it is uh, not actually possible. Uh, anything. Uh, and so Eric and I went to them and said, could we redesign it for you? And they said, yes, please. Would you be terribly offended if we started from scratch instead of building on what you've got there? And they said, yes, please. Uh, so uh, I think this is a really cool opportunity. Uh, we are, uh, so the idea is how would you get people, hey, you heard about this story about greater dropout rates. Maybe you want to volunteer for an organization that tutors people uh, for their GED or helps kids to stay in school. Uh, there's a fascinating social computing research project here. How you go from uh, an issue that the radio station is uniquely positioned to tell us about to getting people to actually do something about it in their community. And what we're hoping to do is to both help the radio station and also develop the most kick butt flexible, sustainable platform for basic research on questions in social computing ever created in the history of the universe. We're going to do it. Uh, so that's the idea. Now, uh, uh, Baby Steps, they're a very small organization, a lot smaller than I ever realized. Um, I may surprise you that uh, there are an order of magnitude more people say at the AJC than at Public, public Broadcasting Atlanta, at a zero, easily. They're very small. Uh, and uh, is this a big funding opportunity for us? Actually, it's more like another mouth to feed. Uh, so, in a lot of ways, I see this as a public service opportunity. Uh, we are uniquely positioned to use this as an opportunity to give back to our community uh, and, and find ways that we can help some folks with what I feel is a very compelling mission. Uh, but uh, they do not have deep pockets, quite the opposite, uh, I think. Uh, uh, it's, it's more of a public service opportunity, but one that I feel privileged to have. So. So that's what we're up to, and you're fine. Can we, um, so we're going to make all this up since I did completely mess up as Amy has now told everyone um, about. But we love you. But yeah. Um, let's let's go ahead and take some questions for Amy before she speaks out. How to get involved? What to do? What kind of things this would look like? Initial designs. Yeah. Well, I think we can ask basic questions about how social computing works that are relevant for everybody. So for example, our core research questions are about mobilization. How do you get people to participate? That is relevant for commercial products and for other nonprofits and for pretty much everything. It's the big question. How do you get people to actually participate? Uh, so uh, I, I think there's some fundamental science questions here that are transferable to other domains as well as potentially being, you know, of course we'll do this all open source and if anyone else wants to use our code, we'd be delighted. Uh, so that would be the more direct application. Yeah, Matt. So, I don't know how far along you are, but I'm curious uh, how, you're, how you're planning to you know, leverage uh, existing social media sites for this and what, you know, what do you see the relationship between the I don't think any social media exists in isolation. Uh, leveraging existing social media where the people already are is core to our research plan. So you come to our website and it's going to give you the option to put something out to Facebook, but the URL on Facebook is going to bring people back to us and hopefully bring your friends back to us and there'll be a, a kind of ecosystem of folks moving in both directions and an ecosystem that we can trace and study. So. Uh, I have to run, uh, but uh, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity, uh, and uh, this has been really interesting. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I've always wanted to grill our fun personally in front of a large audience. Let's see how that goes. See how good I am. Following instructions. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's news. So here is what everybody's doing. Figuring out the timeline of when this video was, okay? There'll be a quiz at the end.
Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. In fact, both local San Francisco papers are investing a lot of money to try and get to service just like that started. Science editor Steve Newman reports on one person already using the brand new system. 17 stories up in his fashionable North Beach apartment, Richard Halloran is calling a local number that will connect him with a computer in Columbus, Ohio. Meanwhile, across town, in this less-than-fashionable cubbyhole at the San Francisco Examiner, these editors are programming today's copy of the paper into that same Ohio computer. When the telephone connection between these two terminals is made, the newest form of electronic journalism lights up Mr. Halloran's television with just about everything the Examiner prints in its regular edition. That is, with the exception of pictures, ads, and the comics. Eight newspapers around the country are currently in the computer network, and within the next few weeks, three others will join in. This is an experiment. We're trying to figure out what it's going to mean to us as editors and reporters and what it means to the home user. And, and we're not in it to make money. We're uh, probably uh, uh, not going to lose a lot, but we aren't going to make much either. It's Both the Examiner and Chronicle began service within the last two weeks and printed full-page ads about it. Of the estimated two to 3,000 home computer owners in the Bay Area, the Chronicle reports over 500 have responded by sending back coupons. Even though the electronic newspaper isn't as spiffy looking as the ads imply, people using the system are excited about its potential. With this system, we have the option not only of seeing the newspaper on the screen, but also we, optionally we can copy it. So anything we're interested in, we could go back in again and copy it onto paper and save it which I think is, a great, is, is the future of the type of interrogation an individual will give to the newspapers. This is only the first step in newspapers by computer. Engineers now predict the day will come when we get all our newspapers and magazines by home computer, but that's a few years off. So for the moment at least, this fellow isn't worried about being out of a job. Steve Newman, New Center 4. Well, it takes over two hours to receive the entire text of the newspaper over the phone, and with an hourly use charge of $5, the new telepaper won't be much competition for the 20 cent street well, edition. Show Walter Isaacson. How to save your newspaper. I couldn't think of a more worthy cause. I love the newspaper, there's nothing better then sitting down in the morning with a cup of coffee and when I used to smoke uh, cigarettes and the newspaper and leisurely thumbing your way through uh, the world, <laughs> but how do we do it? Well, first of all, newspapers are more popular than ever. Magazines are more popular than ever, even among young people, but they're reading them on the internet and everything on the internet is free. I think you got to get away from this notion that good reporting has always got to be given away for free on the internet. Good blogs, good music, whatever it may be. You see music now, people are charging for it on iTunes. I, I just think you got to get to some system where some journalists are getting paid for going to Baghdad. This is ridiculous. I, I can't know, even I believe we're know. talking about this. I know, I know, I know. Sir, the internet is free. I think everybody knows that. No matter what you look on, it is free. You know, when I was young tried. and I used to go fishing with my friend Thomas, he had a theory that ice should be free. So he'd steal it from outside of those things. What are you, Andy Griffith? What kind of yeah. way are we going with this? <laughs> well, when we, I was we, down we, at the creek, <laughs> we never thought about who's going to make the ice if everybody thinks ice is free. You got to think about who's going to send people to Baghdad if always everything in journalism is free. Let's see. In the beginning, I report was a concept the king of fake news found ripe for parody. Hmm. And here's a picture of Ryan and his mom in front of the world's biggest ball of twine. But you quickly grabbed your cameras to become real citizen journalists, rapidly changing the who, what, where, and how of journalism. So, any guesses on the first one? 1982. 30 years later. So one of the things, the reason I show this video, by the way, for those of who care, I actually also teach a class on this kind of stuff and I do a lot of uh, think tanks and conversations across the nation and across international uh, borders these days on this whole issue. That there's a disruption out there. iPad is among other things about disruptive technologies, right? Trying to understand where the disruption is. We just kind of show what the disruption was or is. More importantly, and I think this connect back to what Amy was saying, is I think what the new generation is interested in is engagement civic engagement of different sorts. They want to be actually close to the information. So when I teach this class, just like Eric was saying, I have about 40 people in that room, and I ask them, how do you consume news? 
They don't consume it like we do. In fact, they don't even know what New York Times is. And that's the model that we're stuck to. That's the authoritative information we go for. But at the same time, now start thinking about New York Times as an international, I mean, international and a national newspaper, and all of a sudden think about what happens to Atlanta Journal Constitution or creative loafing. How does civic conversation happen? How do, for example, public squares, you know, remember in the old days when you talk to your parents and stuff like that, they most probably said that they went to the high school gymnasium for a conversation about the neighborhood. That's kind of the public square has vanished into the ether world. And actually one of the biggest questions that we have to start thinking about within this is how do you bring social computing and also media technologies, and that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in, is the analysis of technology and the content itself. How do you get things out of video? How do you get things out of text? The kind of stuff Jacob was talking about. And how do you bring it forward from the technology perspective on the journalism pipeline, the workflow of capturing information, sharing it, distributing it, and more importantly as what we can do is actually at the end consuming it and editing it and voting on it because we do a lot of that. How do you take that pipeline and understand how computation, network technologies, machine learning, data mining, and analysis of content has changed that? So this was just a small snippet of it. Let's open this up for questions and discussion. And actually, one of my goals Reactions. in life is to start all of my talks with David Litterman, oh, sorry, with uh, John, John Stewart. Stewart. <laughs> I'm getting there. All lectures start with John Stewart. Bruce. Yes, Bruce. Distinguish the notion of the value added that journalists provide. Right? There's this concept that the journalist does something more than hold a camera at very low. And uh, how do we kind of bring on this, you know, the, 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 the eye cameraman and the eye journalist and the eye reporter and still have professionalism or value added? So there is a huge argument that's been brewing in the community now, which has been addressing the question is, what is a journalist? Uh, on the parallel, the social computing has evolved to kind of have what is, could be referred to as a beast with a billion eyes, right? This beast with a billion eyes was initially referred to with things like Wikipedia, where people could collectively author content and you know, generate, for example, an encyclopedia. But then all of a sudden, you notice examples of what happened in Iran during the post-election era. Lots of eyes were there. So they were, in essence, among other things, purely eyewitnesses with a camera and we could actually be like, you know, I use the example of gargoyles from Snow Crash, I'm also a science fiction buff, which basically you can actually now see through some people's eyes. And that's what you get out of these cameras everywhere. You get facts and eyewitnesses. Journalists are supposed to do, supposed to, and actually that's a you know, conflicting statement depending on which channel you watch yourselves. Uh, supposed to contextualize and bring you fair information about things which let citizens act on their behalf to do much more things about their li daily living. Now that question still remains. You know, somebody takes a picture and uploads it, they're not actually contextualizing it, they're just sending you a picture. So the question does remain, and actually that's one of the struggles in this thing is, one thing that's become very easy is the news gathering phenomenon. How is information gathered, which has resulted, in, among other things, changing, for example, and I hope nobody from a local television hears because they're going to get offended in the next second, is all of a sudden, you know, that news report starting next to a traffic accident saying, oh, five hours ago there was an accident here, doesn't have a job anymore because somebody who's driving by the street with their handheld camera can take that picture and upload it. And so that's another disruption that's happened. I don't know if that answered your question, Bruce. So one of the things that I already find interesting in this conversation is there have been so many versions of computational journalism which is about turning the general public into journalists. And I think both what Amy has said and what you have said is that the call to action isn't necessarily to produce journalism, but the call to action is producing civic participation based on that information and the social media surrounding that. What are some opportunities in addition to what Amy's discussed where we can explore that as a community either through the lens of service or through the lens of research? So, I mean, there, of course, I mean, you know, uh, one of the things uh, that Georgia Tech is very good at is, you know, among other things, is this human-centric angle. This is about generating technologies that humans can use to empower and generate better information, okay? So, you know, examples I use is there's a lot of disinformation out there, okay? So we need to build technologies to support it, and human-centric design types of issues are the ones to bring it closer to people. What we also need is tools for citizens to be able to consume information much better than they can. I mean, yes, we are actually what I refer to is in the era of aggregation. Digital aggregation is here. Sense making is far away, 
right? So the question now comes up is, and that's why I kind of, I'm, you know, my background is really in AI and machine learning and computer vision and stuff like that. That's why I'm speaking to this topic is, we need to bring those technologies towards more of a user, human-centric design kinds of stuff. I mean, I actually was very familiar with this project. Amy's working on, can I speak to it about as much as I want, because I was involved with the earlier version of it. And they came to me, and my biggest advice to them was find somebody like Amy and Eric to work on it, or start figuring out how to use Facebook and Twitter rather than generating your own infrastructure to do it. There are so many APIs out there. I teach a class on it, and uh, at the end of it, I don't even tell them the APIs, and I did a survey, and they came up with the number of APIs that are out there to do things from sentiment analysis on text to being able to kind of generate mashups in like minutes to doing all of that stuff. Now, these are tech students who can do this. We need to start kind of moving this both upwards and downwards. So journalist education needs to account for it, but at the same time, <coughs> citizens can start using this kind of information too. I can keep going on far hours. You don't want me doing this. Uh, we're running a little bit late, yeah. but Ron, we're going to. Ron, to pose a question here. I know in social media, there's, uh, I heard recently Microsoft pays $10 million bucks just for the stuff off of Facebook about Microsoft to look at how people are seeing it. And people are quickly turning around and injecting things into social media to change the opinions of the, that audience. And uh, computational journalism, is there a possibility that we'll close this loop so tightly that we won't have an opinion anymore? Uh, well, I, I, would, I would try to pose an answer for you would be uh, hopefully not. Hopefully, actually, it will allow us to have more information in the pipeline. I mean, it's not about closing the loop. It's actually about opening it to different channels. I mean, within one of those things is, and actually, this is also a social commentary more than anything else, is uh, our society, and I'm not just talking about US, by the way. For example, anybody who wants to count, there are 40 24-hour news channels in India right now. 24-hour news channels in India. Okay, the rest of the world is also moving in this direction of 24-hour news. There isn't that much happening in the world, folks. <laughs> okay? I mean, and again, this is a quote from John Stewart again. But it's about opening the challenge and getting the citizens engaged again and trying to get to the information. So it's, and of course, there is a whole thing about influence in there. And there's another whole aspect of it, which anybody who's done any work on economics, I'd love to chat with you. We're getting into this area is how to monetize it. That was one of the reasons I put that thing up is the monetized model is gone. Classified sucked it all away. Those mansions that Hearst built are gone because the financial model is gone. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So IPAT brings together a number of discussions of communities of the Georgia Tech campus. And I think this panel is going to exemplify the reach of those conversations because we're about pulling together uh, uh, faculty and staff here at Georgia Tech interested in economic development, interested in community service, interested in applied research, and then interested in creative or academic scholarship. And literally this panel, this panel is a mashup of many of, those, uh, many of those concerns. And the description itself is a mashup, community or civic computing meets midtown buzz. And so we have placed a number of panelists together. They're gonna to both talk to you about uh, interesting visions in the economic development side, and ambitious uh, research challenges and how we might pull that together as a community. So take it away, Matt. Great, thank you. Um, this is exciting, we're gonna jump right in. Um, and uh, I, I'm actually curious, so how many, how many folks out there have heard of uh, Midtown Buzz or Innovation Mile? Or, okay, too many of you that I can't invite you to come up on the panel, but. Uh, um, I think this, the, part of our goal here is to demystify uh, some of this, although my, my guess is gonna, we're going we're gonna to wind out uh, and, and get a, a big and diverse view, and uh, maybe our goal can be that by the end we can, we can uh, come to some, uh, some nice summary. So we'll start with, uh, with Stephen. Uh, Stephen Fleming is the Vice President of the Enterprise Innovation Institute at Georgia Tech. Uh, EI Squared is responsible for Georgia Tech's economic development and business outreach functions. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about economic development. I'm going to talk about economic development in Atlanta. Uh, I'm going to start with my mom. Uh, my mom was, I was born here. My mom was born here. Her parents were born here. And my mom remembered uh, when Atlanta and Birmingham and Louisville, Kentucky were all about the same size and they were all about a quarter million people. 
And if you looked lately, Atlanta's five and a half million people. And what happened is after World War II, when the government was shoveling out economic development dollars, Birmingham and Louisville renovated their train stations. And Atlanta built an airport. And that made all the difference. Uh, and that, it, it is amazing how many of the companies that have relocated to Atlanta or that have grown in Atlanta point to Hartsfield as being one of the truly key elements of why they've been successful in Atlanta. And I submit that in 20 years, that's not going to make any difference at all. And so that the keystone of our econ economic development um, for the last 50 years at Hartsfield is gonna be, eh, nice. Yeah, you got a good airport, good, good for you. But, but what's really gonna be important and, and what could cause somebody else to do to us uh, what we did to Birmingham uh, is high bandwidth, low latency networks that are ubiquitous, that are cheap or free, and that are available to absolutely everybody. Because it's no longer gonna be so important to live close to an airport where you can go see your customers in person, it's gonna be really important to be sitting on networks where those customers can do business with you instantaneously and where you can have the right infrastructure to run that business and to attract the people that you need to build that business. And they're gonna to wanna to live where those high bandwidth, low latency networks are. Um, so we're, we're talking Midtown Buzz, uh, we're, we're, and I'm gonna let the people who know more about it than I do talk about it, but in the historical sweep of things, uh, I just wanna point out this, this isn't an interestingly geeky research project, although it is that and that's fun. Um, this, this is how to prevent Atlanta from being birmingham -ed. And if anybody here's from Birmingham, I apologize, but I don't wanna be Birmingham. Great, thank you. Yep, so uh, Keith Edwards, who has a slide, uh, is a professor of interactive computing and director of the GVU Center. His research focuses on creating new technical infrastructures to support interaction. Thanks, Matt. So uh, Beth told me I had three minutes, so I'm gonna try to use my three minutes to compress down some uh, discussions that probably over a dozen people in GVU have been having for the past, uh, past few months, um, and try to give a quick overview of an area that a lot of us are interested in working in. Um, and there'll be some overlap, as you'll see as I go through this with the, uh, the previous panel also. Um, but the problem that we're focused on is really a, a very big one, which is that over about the last 60 years or so, there's been a, a serious decrease in engagement uh, in the U.S. with pretty much all forms of civic, uh, civic engagement. This includes everything from participation in bowling leagues, those of you who have read Putnam's famous book, <laughs> Bowling Alone, know about this, to even just knowing your neighbors, to voting, to participating in neighborhood organizations, and, uh, and so forth. And we know that neighborhoods that are disengaged suffer disproportionately from crime, uh, from a lack of ability to pull together in crisis situations, and from a whole bunch of other, uh, other evils. So our question is, what's the role that technology might play here? And so we're interested in exploring, in particular, the ways that social media might be used to increase civic engagement and, uh, and participation. Um, and we think there are a number of kind of core research hurdles that have to be overcome in order to uh, address this. Um, I should say, in addition to Beth giving me the strict mandate of three minutes, she also gave me the strict mandate of one slide. But the way to overcome that is to use a lot of bills, so I have a number of bills on this. Um, so the first one is that, first and foremost, we know that civic engagement begins uh, with local engagement. Really, uh, location and small neighborhoods are really important in getting people engaged and organized and, uh, and motivated. Um, and despite this, if you look at current uh, social media technologies and things like location-aware technologies, they're being pretty underexploited, right? They're used to do things like give you a 50% coupon at Starbucks when you happen to walk by or tell you what bars your friends are at. So we think there's a lot of potential here and a lot of opportunity to build social media technologies that exploit the local or even the hyper-local to create ways that you can have very focused you know, neighborhood or even block by block kinds of discussions to pull people, uh, pull people together. 
we're, we're going to go to one PDF page here next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second is that social media today don't really support dissent or contentious voices, right? It's all too easy to defriend people that we disagree with on Facebook, to join social media sites that in the first place are kind of focused around our ideological <laughs> viewpoints. And so you get these sort of self-reinforcing silos or echo chambers where people hear the voices that are already like theirs and dissent and, uh, and sort of a more rich discourse um, don't really get, uh, get pursued in today's social media the way they should. Um, the third is that too many voices are excluded. So if you look at the demographics of social media, they don't really mirror the demographics of the U.S. as a whole, right? Too many neighborhoods are excluded from social media. And it turns out that these are very often the same neighborhoods that are excluded from other aspects of the political discourse. Now, we happen to know that in a lot of cases, bringing these voices into participation is not just a problem of, uh, of access, of uh, giving people cheaper free computers, but often it requires completely different kinds of technology that are designed around, uh, around the concerns of these communities. Um, and finally, current social media systems uh, are really good at kind of reinforcing ties that people already have, for keeping you in touch with the friends that you already have. They're much less good about building new ties and extending the reach of the people that you can build that social capital with um, outside of the, uh, the connections that you already have. And we know that that form of social capital is really strong for, uh, for building strong neighborhoods. Um, so to wrap up, we think there's a real opportunity here to, to explore different kinds of social media and, and doing that in the local context. Atlanta is a, a fabulously diverse and rich uh, city uh, in, in a lot of dimensions, and a number of folks have already started trying to build those connections to neighborhood planning units and to the city of Atlanta to try to, uh, try to explore the ways that we might do this. Right. Thanks, Keith. So next up is uh, Christopher Ladontek. Uh, is an assistant professor of digital media in the School of Literature, Communication, and Culture at Georgia Tech. His research integrates theoretical, empirical, and design-based investigations of community technologies with a specific interest in developing mobile technologies for the disenfranchised and marginalized segments of society. Chris? Great, thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about some uh, speculative plans that are coming together um, around a project in Midtown to build out a design space that we would have community members come in um, and do different kinds of work with us and with each other to learn about technology, um, to do some of this engagement, the civic engagement work to identify different issues that they might be facing, um, and to, to come up with solutions uh, to those issues. So Carl DeSalvo, who I don't know if he's, he was able to walk in late, he and I do work generally in this space, um, thinking about how to use different participatory design methods and design research as a way to engage people in identifying issues that they're dealing with and then coming up with new solutions to those issues. And so what we want to do, and, and we've started, Carl has been leading this, started to talk to the people who are redeveloping uh, City Hall East over on uh, Ponds. And there's space there for us to use, um, and it's, as Carl says, it's not a done deal, but it could be a done deal, um, where we could set up an off-campus lab space where we have this kind of community design center or hack lab and use that as a place to do a number of different types of activities. Um, so the first would be able to you know, have it there so that we have um, space that's not on the Georgia Tech campus to engage with the community in structured projects that are sponsored by you know, our different research partners, whether that's the NSF um, or Intel or any number of other folks, maybe even locally. Um, we would also use the space to host workshops, um, both for students and for faculty, and for students and faculty to lead those workshops in different kinds of technologies or different kinds of um, activities that they're looking to do. Um, doing things like having an open, um, open studio hours or drop-in hours for, for people to come in and experiment with different things. So you can imagine having a bunch of different desks with, um, say, with just kind of normal computing uh, resources there, but also having bins full of Arduinos or other types of hardware sensors and having people coming in and, and using those to, to think about what they might want to do in their community, whether that's building out different kinds of sensors or building out cameras and surveillance systems. Um, 
And then finally, using that as a space for public demos. So a lot of the work that happens here in GVU, um, and well, as well as an iPad, has some impact in the, the Atlanta area. But it gets showcased here, physically, in this building really well, frequently. Um, but there are opportunities, I think, to showcase some of that same work out in the community in a way that's more inviting, instead of have, always having people come to us, take this opportunity to go to them. Um, as we think about getting this project up and going, the, I guess the building is set to come online um, in the beginning of 2014. And the reason the, this is a, a particularly good location for us to think about doing this is that it's being redeveloped by the same company that redid the Chelsea Markets in New York City. So if you're familiar with that, you know it's a, it's a very nice kind of redevelopment, mixed use. So there's, uh, there's going to be retail space. There will be office space for kind of high-tech incubators, like, you know, say, a thousand square foot lot so a, a new startup can come in and, and get things going. Um, and there's going to be residential space. It's on the MARTA line, so it's easy for students to jump on the bus and go straight up Ponce and they get off and they're right there. It's also on the Beltway, so the, the space spe specifically that we're talking about is on the west side of the building, and it abuts where the, where the green Beltway is going through. And this fall, if the light rail is passed, it's supposed to be the first segment of light rail. So it's going to be very well connected to the city. Um, and it provides us a way to do these kinds of things and, and you know, have people come off and, and into the neighborhoods to show off work as well as to learn with each other. I think there are kind of three things that we need help with from iPad as well as from, from partners in Atlanta. One is, is just the logistics of getting this real estate up and going. Um, neither Carl nor I are, you know, real estate managers, so that part we would like to not have to do. Um, but really, the, the two pieces that are most important is developing uh, public programs that really engage the community. So we have a number of sponsored projects that we're working on, but the, the more that we can put into this space and make it feel vibrant and make it feel alive, the more successful it will be and the better it will be for Georgia Tech's image within the community as being engaging and being welcoming. Um, the other thing, and, and, and I think in this way, maybe, um, it's the flip side of, of the infrastructure problem, but I think it's not just a matter of building infrastructure and then hoping in 50 years they will come, but really thinking about what are the kinds of social infrastructures and the kinds of social activities and human infrastructures that you need to build out to make use of these technologies in meaningful ways. Um, and so while it's great that we, we have a plan or we have um, thoughts about how to build out um, low latency, high bandwidth network access. Um, I think we also need to, to match that with a plan of how do we build out and think about engaging kind of society around us and, and developing their understanding and their ability to use those technologies and that capacity uh, for their benefit. Great. Thanks, Chris. Next up is uh, Becky Grinter. Uh, Becky is a professor of interactive computing in the College of Computing. Her research interests focused on human-centered computing, with particular emphasis on understanding the impact of technology on the marginalized and underserved at home and abroad. Okay, I, uh, I drive home through Midtown uh, every night. And uh, when I'm there, when, when I first heard about Midtown Buzz, I sort of thought, wow, it's more technology for people that are really like me, you know, as I felt my iPad and my uh, Nano and my telephone and my laptop all clinking together as you go over the road humps there. Um, you know, Midtown is, but Midtown is also interesting, right? It's what yeah, I think I would call a partially transformed neighborhood, right? There's been amazing change in the composition of people that now live and work in Midtown. They are digitally collected. You only have to walk up and down Peachtree Street to see the people talking on their phone, right? They, you take your phone out, you look at wireless networks, they're like 14 or 15, you scroll through to find the one that's open and you log on. But it's not completely transformed, right? And I once was thinking about how could I explain this? So in May 2011, in six days, there were 79 arrests in Midtown for prostitution, of which 50 were men, 11 were female, and eight were Johns. It's tied to the workforce, the young urban workforce. Um, <laughs> So I would love to know more about this. I was uh, I stopped at the reading of the news reports and I couldn't access the police reports. But my point is that there's another piece to Midtown, and I don't hear them or the challenges that they potentially represent represented in visions of Midtown Buzz. And so I started to think, well, what would happen if you took from a research perspective? And there's a critique of community computing that suggests that as it's evolved as a research area, it's got less and less interest 
interested in community. Uh, it's gotten very interested in online community, but it would be an error to mistake the digital for the physical. So what would it mean to create a Midtown Buzz that actually created a conversation among all the members of the Midtown community and perhaps started discussions much like the Santa Monica Public Electronic Network in the 1990s did when the home started speaking to the homeless in Santa Monica and started discussing how the homed people were going to help the homeless people in getting themselves back off the streets and into full paid employment. Um, what would it mean to not to use these technologies not to empower people to work harder or to watch more TV at home or even to watch TV on the go, but to actually start to engage with the totality of the Midtown community? Because if Midtown wants to be a community that's transformed, it's going to have to pro provide transformative kinds of things for everybody that's there. So um, that's sort of what I've started thinking about. And so what do I think that we have uh, as advantages? Well, Georgia Tech is really interested in this kind of social and civic engagement. There are lots of people that care about not just perhaps this from a community computing uh, perspective, but about sort of... Uh, emancipation, empowerment, all these different kinds of things and the role of technology within that. And it ties to bigger interests. I see Mike Best over in the corner who represents a segment of the research space who are passionate about technologies and understanding the relationship about between technologies and development as it plays out in the developing world. But this is just an instance of the same kind of problem. It just happens to be in underserved parts of the United States. And we have them right here. So I think there's lots of, I think also, and I, I, Irfan, who sits at the other side of the room, is to thank for this, has just started a dialogue between some of us in the city of Atlanta, uh, the government, and I think we're going to need their participation if we really want to do this, and I think so that has the potential to be uh, very rich. Uh, there's already some really interesting things that have popped out of the first conversation. So um, I just sort of wanted to try to take Midtown Buzz and leave a slightly different vision in your mind of exactly who that community might be and what we might use to do with technology for. Great, thank you. Okay, that's me. So uh, next up is Ron Hutchins. Uh, Ron is the Associate Vice Provost for Research and Technology and the Chief Technology Officer in the Information of, uh, Office of Information Technology. Uh, Ron came to Georgia Tech in 1981 and admits it. Uh, and <laughs> continues to work to support research and academic programs across the campus. I was only six at the time, though. <clears throat> um, in that career that I've been here, um, a couple of things have gone on that have been interesting. And in about 12 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, we took networking into the dormitories. And uh, it was an interesting thing that happened. Our dormitories were about 60 to 70 percent occupancy rate at the time. We put 10 megabit Ethernet in there, and the post departments came to us a couple months later and said, you're killing us. What have you done? Because we were 100 percent occupied after that point in time. Now, what were the students doing? They were doing online gaming and lots of different things. We didn't really have a reason for putting networking in, other than we thought it was good for the, the classes. I'm sure that somebody had classes that used the networking at that time. We're doing a lot better now. So I'm, I'm here to talk about an infrastructure play. You've heard a lot of ideas about how to use the Midtown Buzz and what we're doing with technology around social media and a lot of other things. But at the bottom of it, there's a technology that has to be there. Now, we have technologies. All of us have things like this, and we have cell phones, and we have smartphones, and we have networks at home. But in a sense, it's when you get an, a, a quantum jump in the capabilities of the technologies that you have that things change. The iPhone was a game changer. Why? Because the quantum difference in the ability of the interface and the ability of the screen to do things that we want. Why did Ethernet change the game in the dormitories? Because we were using, you know, what, uh, 56 kilobit modems was the best thing you can do, like the, the dial phone that we were doing. I already remember those things. We, I still have one at home, in fact. It's in my museum. So the, the, the question, you ought to see my museum. It's pretty cool. The question is, what's the technology that we need to get to generate that next increment? And so we've been discussing uh, with um, several of us around what's that next thing to, to be and 
One idea is if we take this campus as a microcosm and look what we've done on the campus, uh, Matt has been working on a wireless network here on the campus for many years. I think we have one of the best in the country. We've got you know, nearly 6,000 radios that are supporting 20,000 unique users on a regular day on the wireless network. We also have cellular technologies on the campus, but cellular technologies you pay by the minute. What happens when you don't have to pay by the minute? What happens when the technology gets to be where you can do 200 megabits a second on your handheld, and what are you going to do with it? So I, I think I'm pushing this notion of let's take the infrastructure out into the community. I don't know how far we can get. Maybe we need to get down to the cheetah in order to help that segment of the population, but <laughs> at least we need to get somewhere where we have the community at large that's using the technologies in ways that we haven't thought about it. And I guess that's where I'm pushing is technology itself is just an underpinning to do something. And what is it we're going to do? And what I want to do is to challenge all of us in the room to come up with these notions of the, the applications, the uses that the technology is going to bring that's going to change the way we do business in our city. We've seen it on the campus. I've seen technology change the, the face of the campus. What are we going to do to change the city, even by going out a mile at a time? Great. Thank you. So I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience now. Anyone? You always, you always have a question. Do I get to go yeah. on? All yeah, right. I get to ask first instead of last. So I've heard many narratives around the Atlanta Birmingham story and some of the narratives about our investments in future technology. There's also a narrative. I'm just going to. Great, so now I have to summarize that. Yeah. <laughs> Just make up your own question. Right, so um, the question was how do we, how do we develop um, kind of the human capacity to go along with these to solve pressing future social problems? Um, and I think this is part of the, the motivation behind setting up this community design space is actually coming up, fr up front and saying, look, we don't know the answers to all of these things, but if we start to develop the capacity of fellow community members to think about technology in different ways, then they will be able to go out and mash up data in a different way and find the problem that they didn't actually know existed before and then start to address it. Or they will be able to develop the applications or the devices that they want to, to deploy in their neighborhoods to address these things. I think one of the other pieces to this, in particular to the, the location at the Pont City Market, is that by having this kind of community design center mixed in with what is what are ostensibly supposed to be startups and other kind of, you know, movers and shakers in the city, then you start to get some, you know, feed, you get to feed into that conversation, into that ethos and that culture. And so it's not just about, oh, well, you know, we have a bunch of startups doing things, but we also have community members coming in and talking to those people and sharing ideas with those people and learning from them. Um, and so that would be kind of where I would say we start with that anyway. I want, so I want to add that um, I think, um, 
it's not only that I think this is something that I mean for me it's the research question is how do we uh, get more people involved how do we really engage the entire community and make sure that um, we do things that are amplifying for everybody my fear is is that if we don't then we actually make the situation worse Right? And so to me, that's the fundamental. If we only serve the people that are the most capable to be served, then actually what we do is just continue to exacerbate a digital divide, which continues to sit atop a whole other set of stratifications and imbalances in power that already exist in the city. So I think when we move forward in this, that's why I, that's why I wanted to be provocative, is because I think that if we don't put everybody's interests on the table early on, we are gravely likely to miss people, and if we do, we will actually make the situation worse, which if we do it in a transformative way would be really terrible. It would be not like just messing up in the laboratory, but actually messing up in the city is not what we want to do. Stakes are high. Okay, you said you wanted to talk about Mercy on the panel, okay. Uh, okay, um, I get it. I really get it. But at the same time, that can be a cop-out to not do anything until we can do everything. And, and if you've got someone in Midtown who's 27 years old and reading at a third grade level and doing math at a third grade level, there's very little that a high bandwidth, low latency network is going to do to engage that person in any meaningful way. We've got to go fix K through 12. We've got to go fix a lot of different things. but. If we wait until we fix K through 12 before we start deploying interesting networks, we're not going to do the networks. So I'm going to challenge the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have friends who work in uh, food kitchens, and it was amazing for me to find out that the one thing that homeless people have is a cell phone. If they have nothing else, they have a cell phone because that's how they keep in touch with the shelters. That's how they know where they're going to sleep at night. There's all of these things that they do with a cell phone that they couldn't do otherwise. And so, in some sense, even it's the, the lowest rung that needs the most help, that, that technology can help them as much as anything else. And I think there's already evidence out there, again, I go back to the Santa Monica example, which is just putting people in contact with each other to begin to talk about what the the problem of the homeless is quite something to a homed person versus a homeless person, right? And actually creating a dialogue where both sides are listening and beginning to get other people's, other the other perspectives um, was sort of, in the 90s was the thing that Santa Monica was using to try and actually bring more people off the streets and into employment. So I think that dialogue is a root. So I think there are some pieces that we, we have some ideas about, and I think the Pont City Market I, idea, of, to get people more engaged, to create conversations around technology, to create that literacy that people can have to begin to imagine futures that they might have with technologies and have more, more sort of roots into understanding how it might help them. So so I think I think this is I think there's enough technology and enough levels of price that this is a good time to start creating a kind of technological literacy that's not just one you get through formal education, but once you can actually get through the community and then use that to empower people in Midtown. And maybe it's completely complementary, along with trying to get 27-year-olds to do to do more work or whatever it is they'll do with high bandwidth. But I think we want to do all of these things. I think that's the part the the richness of this space. Great. All right. Uh, in the back, your phone. Are you offering to lead the crisis? <laughs> <laughs> To, to summarize, Ar Arfan says we need a crisis. I think he's arguing to be the, uh, the evil overlord of our crisis. Um, one, one could argue that there are parts of the city that are currently in crisis. Um, and, 
And uh, one of our city councilmen, who happens to be a graduate from that school that doesn't play football, MIT, is uh, Kwanzaa Hall. And uh, he's declared this to be the year of Boulevard. And those of you who aren't familiar with the Boulevard, uh, if, if there's any urban area in Atlanta that qualifies as crisis, uh, it's Boulevard between uh, Martin Luther King uh, birthplace and Ponce. Um, and they're doing a lot this year trying to focus on, on getting that stretch of Atlanta um, more, more connected, um, not just in terms of cell phones, but in terms of knowing your neighbors and knowing the people across the street. Um, that could grow. I mean, you know, we're 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 talking doing, you know, uh, bandwidth up and down Peachtree. Maybe we should be talking bandwidth up and down up and down Boulevard. Great, Janet. summarize Janet's, uh, Janet's uh, comments and questions. I'm awesome, um, uh, as is Janet. Uh, but uh, <laughs> ja Janet, uh, Janet's co commentary was that in addition to creating an airport, Atla it was Atlanta's approach, and particularly Ivan Allen, who happens also to be a GT alum, um, and uh, uh, approach to uh, civil rights and his uh, working and collaborating with Martin Luther King that has helped Atlanta to get to where it is. So there are narratives around technological infrastructure and there are narratives around social infrastructure and around uh, collaboration that we have to attend to. And I think that's the thing that's really cool about this panel from like, uh, we've got it soup to nuts here, right? We've got people that are really passionate about all aspects of technology from laying the foundations through to creating the applications, through to figuring out how to monetize those applications. And we've got the neighborhoods and uh, thanks, and we've, I think we can get some interest from the government. So I think that's the power of this particular mixture is that we care about all of these things simultaneously. So the odds are good that we will work on all of these fronts. Great, I, uh, I don't think I could have uh summarize that any better. I think, I think uh, that's a great place to close. Thanks very much. Thank you. So um, as many of you can tell, that panel was a particular construction of a number of conversations coming together. And it's also an inv invitation to our community to contact any of the people that you just saw, as well as other folks who chimed in, uh, to understand how to engage uh, this as a one Georgia Tech, and very much in the spirit of Georgia Tech's uh, notion of progress and service, thank you, with respect to the future of the city of Atlanta. Um, I also wanted to pay attention to another implied invitation, and it's something that you can read about uh, in the flyers and on the web, 
is that a number of folks have mentioned, you know, we teach the class in this, and then the students are really engaged. And one of the magic tricks that we have at Georgia Tech is connecting our classes and our research with something called the Convergence Innovation Competition. And so I want everyone who thought about, well, my class can somehow connect to this, to talk to Matt Sanders, to talk to Russ Clark, to talk to Ron Hutchins about how your educational efforts can get connected to these research efforts and these larger ambitions. All right, while, these, while the panel negotiates, the last... The last panel, I will not move. The last panel was designed partially because we knew that we will have talked quite a bit today. And um, although Keith was quite creative in the breaking the one slide rule in multiple ways, um, we wanted to explicitly ask a group of folks to convey their research leadership and the leadership that they bring to Georgia Tech through example. Uh, the title is very broad to try to encompass many of the different things that are being done within the digital media, arts and storytelling and narrative. And so these panelists are going to produce, are going to provoke with a few questions, but then show you some video examples of the work that we're doing, and then we'll move from this into the close. So I'll turn this over to Dar. Okay, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Thank you for staying to the end. I know we stand between you and drinks and food, um, but storytelling, st storytellers, um, technologists included, really are the ultimate futurists because they are the ones that can imagine and bring forth uh, scenarios and experiences that might not um, exist before. So uh, here first we have Janet Murray. Um, Janet is Ivan Allen uh, College uh, Dean's Professor in the Graduate Program in Digital Media within the School of Literature, Media and Culture, where she directs the ETV Lab. She's the author of Hamlet on the Holodeck, which predicted the current fusion of TV and interactivity, and most recently, Inventing the Medium, Principles of Interaction Design as a Cultural Practice. Uh, second, we have Ali um, Mazalik, am I pronouncing that? Is an associate professor in the Digital Media Program and GVU Center, where she directs the uh, Synesthetic Media Lab. Her lab is a playground where physical materials, analog sensors, and digital media happily coexist and come together in crazy ways to support creativity and expression. Next, we have Brian Majerko, who is an assistant professor in the Digital Media Program and GVU Center and director of the Adaptive Digital Media Lab, known as Adam. His research focuses on the study of human creativity and how it can be applied to digital media design and AI-based technologies. And then we have Jason Freeman, who is an associate professor of music in the School of Music and executive director of Sonic Generator, Georgia Tech's contemporary chamber music ensemble in residence. As a composer and computer musician, Freeman uses technology to create collaborative musical experiences in live concert performances and in online musical environments, utilizing his research in mobile music, dynamic music notation, and networked music to develop new interfaces for collaborative creativity. And with that, we'd like to begin our discussion. Hopefully it's as interactive as possible. Janet? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be fast uh, so we could go eat. Um, uh, I think that, I, that what Georgia Tech should be doing more of is prototyping the future uh, with a long view, not just to uh, what works tomorrow or what new platform or what customers come through the door, but with a sense of uh, the history of media. And I think that we are uh, and this, this is an example of something that my group has done lately um, that uh, is a way of using the iPad to structure uh, navigation through, uh, it's a two screen system, there's a TV. This you might recognize the Justify television show which has uh, long form narratives uh, that are very complex uh, and that represents a common problem in television uh, navigation in, in, or in, in taking in a TV story and then in writing them is that they're getting more and more complicated. The arcs go over a longer season. Uh, the characters are multiplying. How do you keep track of that? 
Uh, and we've been working on problems like this for the past 10 years, not thinking about iPads, but thinking about story and assuming a wider notion of just the affordances of the medium. How do you use everything a computer can do to do these common human tasks, cultural tasks of telling each other what life is life uh, like and understanding the world better and increasing our empathy for one another and our understanding of how complex systems work. So, um, so because we've done all of that kind of thinking that comes, that's not platform driven and it's not sponsor driven, then when, uh, when a sponsor or comes through the door or, or when I go and I showed, I actually showed this uh, project, it was a lot of fun, to the people who make Justified, who write it, uh, they, it, it's meaningful to them. And uh, the head writer looked at me and said, gee, I didn't express, expect to be impressed by this. Yeah. I don't like technology, but th we need things like this in order to understand what it is we're doing and, and write more coherent stories. So I think that um, we should be doing more of this and we should be selling, this is something to sell, is that uh, the disruptions that Efron was talking about are really, which are extreme and which uh, uh, the corporate world that, that iPad faces towards and communicates with so well, um, they're, they're, they have an urgent need to understand it, but they are very fixated on what's going to make a dollar in the next six months and, or in the next two years. We can answer those questions by making clear the direction of change. Uh, and we can do that when we work in a platform independent way. Uh, and design out of these research-driven questions, uh, but with very concrete problems. So uh, that's what I think we should do more of, is prototyping the future in that way. I, I tried to answer all of your questions. There was a third one. Oh, yeah. So you should get us more money to do that. <laughs> Duh. And the money should come actually to the professors and, the, and particularly the graduate students. Uh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie? Okay, so, um, so, so I align very much with Janet's view. Um, I think if you give me one second before you start the video, then I can say a little bit of an introduction, and then I promise the video is very short um, and, and fun. <laughs> so so my, my perspective on this though, though, takes a very embodied view. So we're fundamentally embodied beings, and we live in the physical world, and our perceptual and motor processes are very connected to, with our cognitive processes. And then at the same time, we have this digital space, like Janet says, we have this, this new medium that has this vast potential, and this potential um, crosses arts and sciences, it crosses culture, it's like the application spaces are very broad. And, and when I think about um, a vision of where we should be going, I really see the, it, that these two areas have to come together. And I, and I think the last panel addressed this really nicely also from the community perspective, but it also just from the interaction perspective. If we're always just focused on the technology side, then we're kind of removing ourselves from the physical world around us, and how can these two worlds come together? Um, my work takes a particular twist on this, um, not so much from the community engagement side or the citizen aspect, but more from the, uh, the embodiment aspect, and how can actually embodied interaction technologies support creative practices both across arts and sciences, whether this is an interactive storytelling engine or, uh, or supporting computational science in some way. So the demo reel that I'd like to show you um, showcases a few examples, and, uh, and Beth asked different challenges. So there's some subtitles that give you a little hint of what the challenges are, but the challenges are so broad that I couldn't possibly articulate what they are um, in full completeness. So, uh, so let's uh, start that. There's a video track, but I'll say a few words over, to, or an audio track, but you can turn it low. It doesn't have to be high. So here is, uh, so embodying agency in narratives, um, and this is a, uh, this, is a, this is a tangible tabletop role-playing game, and here some of the issues looked at are how do we actually embody our agency with the, within a computational narrative system. Um, this next one here uh, looks at how to design these embodied interactions on a tabletop to let interactors actually explore, navigate, and make sense of a documentary, um, documentary database or set of documentary content.
and the interactions are very playful, <laughs> always. Which is another fundamentally important thing to me, I think, is we like to play. And, and I think technologies afford this well in a sort of you versus the screen and your Xbox controller, or even your Wiimote or something like that. But, but how do we really connect people around that experience and let them create meaning together? So in this case, um, it's really about using, uh, again, it's another tabletop example, but in this case, my, my PhD student, Susan Robinson, used a collage interface and physics to let the interactions actually bring up conflicting viewpoints. So the last panel also addressed this, so like how do we, um, how do we bring up different viewpoints and let people understand the differences? Um, Oh, and then this project here is not, uh, not necessarily narrative, but it's uh, how do we actually project ourselves into virtual avatars through puppet inf interfaces and then use this performance with the, your virtual self to augment your cognitive abilities. Uh, so here, this game actually helps your mental rotation skills. And then lastly, I think without the right tools to design these things, we end up boxing ourselves into one platform, one technology, one thing. So one of the things that my lab, that kind of underlies a lot of the research that we do in my lab is uh, the, the tools that let us cross different platforms. So this is just a very short snippet here, but um, our Responsive Object Surfaces and Spaces API actually lets you pro program across many different platforms, whether it's mobile, tabletop, walls, crazy puppets with sensors all over them, um, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, and and I, am I supposed to answer all the questions, or should we go to the next? <laughs> That's been three minutes. Answer as much as you can okay, in a well, short I'll leave period it there, of time. and then hopefully the other questions will come up. Uh, Brian? Did you say money. Money, yeah, yeah. money, money. <laughs> so uh, in terms of the problem, so Jason and I are going to be talking about the same project in lieu of, of talking about uh, the narrative work that I've done, um, talking about work that's more oriented towards uh, human creativity and uh, performance in the music realm. Um, don't, don't play the video quite yet, though there is some audio if we could keep it a little, little quiet. Um, so there's a dearth of uh, talents in the United States in terms of computer scientists. There are lots, thousands and thousands of jobs that go unfilled by uh, U.S. citizens because we simply don't have the support at the middle school and high school level to engage kids in computer science as a topic. Uh, on a yearly basis, we see drop-off rates in terms of uh, students who are graduating with computer science as an intended major. Um, and it's uh, surprisingly, outside of this bubble that, that I seem to live in here at Georgia Tech, um, just a lack of interest in the topic. Um, so there's a movement called the CS Principles Movement, which is trying to re change the AP curriculum in the United States to focus more on uh, uh, not sorting numbers, um, which was my experience learning computer science, which is sorting numbers really, really well. Um, so, uh, one of the, the main uh, uh, facets of, of that curriculum is focusing on creativity. How do we engage uh, students in creative practices? Um, and the work that Jason and I uh, have been uh, working on this past year is an NSF-funded work on uh, this project called EarSketch, which is engaging kids in remixing music through computational means. So students write code and Python and they, can, they control loops and beats in order to actually create some kind of musical expression um, that's wholly kind of their own thing. Um, the rationale here is that music is kind of this ubiquitous cultural artifact for us. Everybody, everybody, almost everyone really digs music. And in especially underrepresented populations um, like African Americans, there's a high literacy in terms of uh, audio production and working with some kind of sound creation software. So we're leveraging both kind of this ubiquity of, of you know, cultural interest Interest. Um, also, oddly enough, the, uh, the notion of hip-hop music being uh, uh, culturally relevant to Atlanta, being the hip-hop mecca of the, of the South, um, as well as having a strong remixing culture associated with it, as long as, as uh, was electronic music. And uh, trying to kind of pu push all these, uh, uh, smush all these things together in creating an experience that allows for personal expression in a very culturally relevant way that also uses real computing skills as um, kind of the modality for expressing yourself. Um, so the video... The, where, wherever it is. Um, we've been working with a local teacher at uh, Niebel Elementary in Paulding County. Um, and he has uh, been using our, our curriculum and software in an after school program as well as in some of his primary classes. So over 200 students at Niebel Elementary School have already used our software. And uh, you'll see these kids back on the left. This is at this big, what is it, Pepper Alley. 
Uh, and um, the entire school is here, and you can, this is an actual, the music that they're about to play and dance <laughs> crazily to um, was music that was produced in their competing after-school remix club that was using our Earscript uh, software and curriculum. So these kids with the laptop back here are actually playing the remix that was a, an amalgamation of uh, the different remixes that the students in the club did um, uh, put all kind of smushed together and remixed together by, by the teacher. So the kids back here are, are playing this thing and the entire school winds up, I mean the, the video is kind of ridiculous actually, you guys go, you, you go pretty crazy. Um, and this is us after working on this for six months. Um, so there's this very, very cool, like I get warm fuzzies every time I see, every time I watch this. Um, of this entire school going crazy over over this computational remix that uh, fifth graders did. Um, yeah, well, there we go, right? So, yeah, that's us. Great. <laughs> I just I went out a few quick notes here to to, to follow up on Brian. Uh, first of all, just just to clarify here, those are all fourth and fifth grade students that were learning to code in Python. Um, and they wrote all the music that you heard in that video was generated from Python, which they had never used before they started this, about a month prior to that event. Um, and, and like Brian said, I think there's some really unique opportunities here in Atlanta to bring all these things together, the, 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 the presence of the hip hop community here, um, and Georgia Tech's strength in, in computer science, and particularly in CS education, and its long history of innovation in that area. I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunities for us to really build on this and make this a uh, uh, something with, uh, with a, a national rollout. The, the biggest weakness, and I think where we really need some help, is uh, that came from Paulding County. Our other main partner is in Gwinnett County. We've tried and tried and tried and tried over the last nine months to reach out to anyone and everyone in the Atlanta public school system, to the schools that are in our backyards uh, and, and right around this university, and they uh, were greeted by cold, stony silence, pretty much. Um, and I know that Georgia Tech has strong connections uh, and opportunities that we might be able to leverage. We would love to, to do this. Uh, I actually met with a, a former U.S. Senate candidate last week uh, and was telling him about this project, and his first question is, why aren't you doing this in Atlanta? Uh, and and I, I don't want to have to answer that question again. Questions? We'd like to open it up to, oh, go ahead. Just a quick comment. So we are doing some work with education technology in the classroom, particularly in Atlanta, and other places. Great. Excellent. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. I'm going to ask this group to stay here for a second, and you guys are going to tell me the magic square where I can stand um, and not mess up the mics. So I know that, um, actually, I think it's not that people are worried about the food. They're actually worried about the storm system that's heading on its way here. I was watching some people looking at the way their weather radar. But I want to thank very much this panel coming together. And um, it's, it's actually pretty impressive for a whole bunch of disjointed conversations that have been taking across uh, on our campus to actually have so many common themes when we've come together. I mean, we're looking at how we're engaging school systems and changing the social fabric of Atlanta and the future of interactive technologies and how do you move from information to action and how do you engage people in just, you know, new ways. And there without, I'd love to say that this was all masterfully planned, but in reality without, um, top-down design, this community is already responding in so many ways to both pressing challenges that are in Atlanta and beyond, as well as understanding kind of the cutting and bleeding edge of technology and where that can take us. So as we thank this group, as we thank all of the panelists and the people who participate in this process, this is actually the beginning of the conversation. This is an invitation to contact me, contact anybody that has an iPad email address, which means members of the staff, contact the panelists, contact the people that were part of this discussion to, um, to say, I want to get involved. This is, you know, I'm this part of Georgia Tech or I'm this part of the Atlantic community and this is how I would like to, to do this. There's going to be opportunities, official and structured opportunities uh, to, to do this over the summer. And if you're on the IPAT mailing list, you'll hear about that. 
but I also hope people take advantage of all the unstructured opportunities in the conversation because it also begins with our community. So uh, we can take advantage of that uh, in a second when we go out for food and drink. So again, thank you to this crew and thank you to all of the other panelists today.